Father, we thank you for your word. We sit here this evening with a map on the screen for a proposed peace agreement. We have what is apparently a massive swarm of locusts in the area of Kenya, part of Africa, that is apparently devastating and they're concerned it will grow exponentially. We have people we love hunkering down in parts of China as we have what could be a potential pestilence moving around. We, the United States, have wars that we are still engaged in, and there are other nations as well, and we have rumors of wars. And we have parts of the church no longer wanting to hold to your word and at times appear even by their behaviors to deny your name as some are kissing, not only dating goodbye, but you. What an interesting time to open your word and to be reminded that we're on your timetable and not ours. We ask for your peace to fill this place. May your word be simple and clear. And Daniel had such less information than we did, but he wanted to know so badly, what were you going to do for the people of Israel and for the world? And we thank you, Lord, that you have revealed these things to him and to us. And I pray, Father, they would be clear, simple, and they would encourage us to look up because the day of our redemption is most definitely drawing near. Please be with us now, Lord, and bless your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a little bit of a ring going on there, back, David, in the room. I don't know if you guys can hear it. So chapter 9, what we were learning is that as he was speaking in prayer in verse 21 and confessing, the man Gabriel, that is the angel whom he had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched Daniel about the time of the evening oblation, about 3 p.m., and he informed me, verse 22, chapter 9, and he talked with me and he said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider, again, note this, the vision. He's being shown things. And again, 77s or 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, that is the Jews, and upon thy holy city, that is Jerusalem, to do these six things. One, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. That is the first coming of Christ we talked about last week. And to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up or complete vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That will be the second coming of Christ. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command or commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, which we learned last week was given to Nehemiah by Artaxerxes, Longamanus, in March 14th, 445 BC, unto Messiah, the anointed one, the prince, shall be seven weeks, which by the way is 49 years. There are some interesting early battles going on in Rome's history. Rome is sort of tumultuously trying to get itself established, has some ups and some downs, but interesting, some events in 49 years, and then adds a second, and three score and two weeks, which would again be 62 weeks, gives us a total of 69 seven-year periods. So 49 plus 434, 483 years, 69 seven-year periods. And the street shall be built again, this is Nehemiah, and the wall, even in troublous times. You can read that in the book of Nehemiah. And after the three score and two weeks, and the whole is 69 again, but this second one was given as its own set of, own set of numbers. After the three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, again, some argue the idea executed like a criminal, also being used to speak of to cut a covenant. Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself? And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, or the idea of overflowing, or even can be translated outrageous. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27. And he, this prince that shall come, this false Christ, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. How long is that? Seven years. Seven years. And in the midst of the week, how long is that? Three and a half years. Oh, not these numbers again. Just so long. <laughs> Hold on. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. 
For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that that is determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So, Daniel's sitting there trying to take this all in. We have the benefit of time. We can now look and see the 69 sevens have come to pass and that Messiah the Prince has arrived and that he has been cut off or executed like a criminal and it was not for himself. And then after that ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, not long after the city was destroyed and the sanctuary, uh, but I've had, you know, I got an email, it was interesting from a, a dear sister in the church and she said, listen, I'm trying to figure out the math of the 70 sevens, right? And I don't understand what exactly, why, how, why is it important to, to get it. Anybody else share that opinion? <laughs> All right, well, let me step back and give you the big picture. Daniel is seeking after God and saying, you know, I'm reading Jeremiah and we're coming to the end of that 70 years. And there are promises that God had to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, that all the nations would be blessed through their seed, ultimately from Abraham. And he's wondering, how is this, how, you know, here we are on, uh, sitting on ice in Babylon, and how's this going to work out? And so he begins to seek the Lord, and as the Lord begins to reveal it to him, what the Lord basically gave to him in Daniel chapter 9 are two very important timetables. Number one, in the first 69 sevens, he was given the timetable when the Messiah should arrive where he will be cut off. Okay, And so if you take that understanding that Daniel's given, you overlay that with Isaiah the prophet who told us that a virgin will be with child, will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He tells us in chapter 50, he would not hide his face from the smiters, they will pluck out his beard. He tells us of the suffering servant in Isaiah 52 into 53, that his visage will be marred more than any man. He's going to be beaten so badly, he'll be beaten virtually beyond recognition, and that he's going to be beaten with stripes. Yet the Lord is laying on him our iniquities, that he will die with the wicked, yet he'll be buried with the rich, yet he'll see his followers, his seed. He will then prolong his days and he'll be rewarded by the Lord and he will be making victory in a sense over the transgression. He will be paying for these, thin, these sins. Then you go further into Jeremiah promising this new covenant. And other scriptures going on, Zechariah and others, there has been, at the time of Daniel, a number of prophecies given of the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. He'll be born of a virgin. He will be God with us. He will, as we learn from Zechariah, ride in on a donkey, and then we learn about his miracles. He will open the eyes of the blind, Isaiah 35 and 42, the ears of the deaf, the lame will walk, the mute will speak. And so what Daniel is getting is he's getting something that comes alongside these other prophecies. We know where the Messiah will be born, Bethlehem. We know he'll be born of a virgin. We know that he will do these miracles. We know that he'll be betrayed. We know that he will basically die as a criminal, yet be buried with the rich. But the question was, but when will he show up? And what Daniel was given in chapter 9, this first 69 sevens, lets the Jews know when you reach this period of time, 483 years after the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, you should be looking for the Messiah to enter. So we talked about it last week. Jesus riding in down Palm Sunday Road. The Pharisees tell him to be quiet, make his disciples be quiet. He begins to weep over the city in Luke 19. And he said, if you only knew this your day, the things that belong for your peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. And you, uh, your enemies will build a ramp against you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That rebuke and that broken heart of God. So that was the first thing. But he actually gave him two dates. Two important things that are significant. One, the first coming of Christ after 69 sevens and he will be executed like a criminal. Everybody still with me? But then he also gave him another interesting piece of information. And then there will be a final seven years of history, otherwise called one week. And during that one week, there's going to be a prince who rises up who will confirm a covenant with many as we sit here today, looking at a proposed map for a peace plan between Israel and the Palestinians that if it were to go well, might open a door. 
Are you saying this presence the Antichrist? No, I'm not saying necessarily this presence the Antichrist. But it's interesting because notice what it says in Daniel 9, 27. He shall confirm, that is to strengthen or prevail, he shall confirm the covenant. So it may be there's a covenant already on the table, but nobody can get it to work out. And then this individual shows up in the fullness of time and implements. Some used to think it would be the Oslo Accords. Some used to think, you know, some of the other different agreements that have been proposed over the years. And now perhaps it might even be a version of this one. But what happens at the end of those final seven years? Who returns? Jesus. So think about it from the big picture. Daniel is given two very important things. The Messiah will come at a particular time and then be executed. Not for himself. There will be a whole bunch of things that happen. The city will be destroyed. But eventually in time, a ruler will rise up, make a peace agreement. In the middle of that agreement, he's going to cut off the offering. He's going to cut off the sacrifice, the oblation. And then there's going to be a horrible period of time. And at the end of that, interestingly enough, that will be the end of that period. The desolation will be finished. The consummation comes. And we know it is the second coming of Christ. So in Daniel chapter 9, if you slow back, you know, pull back and look at it, He's actually being told of not only the first coming of Christ, where he comes to suffer and die, as it says in that chapter, chapter 9, 26. Messiah the Prince will come and will be cut off. And then we learn there'll be another period of time, seven years, and at the end of that seven years, we know that the kingdom of heaven, God is going to come and rule and reign. The Messiah will come. So interestingly enough, right there you have the first coming of Christ being told with great specificity, and then you have the second coming of Christ being told, but only that it will come or terminate at the end of this seven-year period, where after this, this false agreement breaks apart, all hell breaks loose on the earth. And as Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. So for the Jew... These prophecies in Daniel chapter 9, the significance to them is they should have known the approximate time that the Messiah should enter the city of Jerusalem. They should also be looking for, based on Zechariah 9, as we talked about last week, he will come in on a donkey. They should also be looking for the one who opens the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, the lame will walk, which if you remember when Jesus rode in, he then would go into the temple, do these very miracles and get rebuked by the religious leadership saying, do you not hear these kids crying out saying, save now to the son of David, all messianic titles. And Jesus said, yes. And have you never read that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise. So they should have been looking, but their hearts were hard. Then the rest of that prophecy given to Daniel is, slow down and think about it. When Daniel prophesies these things, it's in the first year of the reign of Cyrus and Darius, which means Jerusalem is sitting in ruins. The temple is sitting in ruins. Cyrus has now taken his authority over Babylon. He issues his decree that the Jews may return and rebuild their temple. And so Cyrus gives that decree. When we get into chapter 10, now we'll be in the third year of the reign of Darius, who's reigning with Cyrus. In that third year, and now the Jews have begun to arrive in Jerusalem, some 49,700, give or take, come back to the land. They begin to prepare houses for themselves. They begin to lay the foundation of the temple. You'll see this in Ezra and Nehemiah. These things are going on. And so they haven't even built the second temple yet. And Daniel is prophesying here in chapter 9 of its destruction. And then he tells us, interestingly enough, in Daniel 9, 27, after that second temple gets wiped out, yet somehow we're going to have an offering and a sacrifice, which means he's seeing not only the first temple has been ruined, he's seeing the second temple will be back in existence, he's seeing the second temple will be ruined, and then eventually there'll be a third temple. You might be saying, ah, I don't get all this. This is where we can go to other prophets. Ezekiel chapter 36 says in the last days Israel will re rebloom fruits and flowers it will put out into the earth and now if you know they export these things fruits, flowers and other things are exported out of Israel agricultural products as well as potash and so fruits and flowers will come out of Israel Ezekiel 37 as it's reblooming and all these things are happening the Jews who have been scattered all over the earth are going to begin to come back to Israel and that's been happening in the last 70 years in significant numbers. And they've come from literally all over Ethiopia and India and Argentina and all over the world. 
Interesting, then in Ezekiel 38 and 39, as the Jews are coming back and the land's reblooming, which means right now, then suddenly what is appearing to be Russia and Ukraine with Turkey, with Libya, with Ethiopia or Sudan, depending on which part of the Nile River they're talking about, as well as other countries are going to suddenly try to invade Israel. It's not going to go well for them. They're going to actually end up being defeated. And interestingly enough, after you have Ezekiel 36, 37, the battle of 38, 39, and Ezekiel 40, you have the third temple. So where are we? Well, we have seen the Messiah has come and has been cut off, and those people have shown up who destroyed that temple. That was the Romans. We are waiting for a third temple, and we're waiting for a false peace agreement that appears to allow that third temple. Meanwhile, in the news, we have rumor again of maybe this will be it. And we're waiting for a sudden invasion of Israel by Russia, by these other nations, for whatever reason. And then suddenly the final seven years of human history. So for the Jew, what Daniel 9 gives you is it gives you the coming of the first, the first coming of Messiah, virtually um, to the day. And then it gives you the second coming of the Messiah to establish his kingdom. Please don't miss this, interestingly enough, and there's a gap of time between the first coming and the second coming where he comes at the end of that 70th week. It's almost like he was trying to tell the world there was going to be like a 2,000-year gap, which would be the time of the Gentiles in the church age. Interesting thing to look at. Now, what does it mean for you, the believer, Daniel 9, 27. Well, there should be number one great encouragement because when you see that we have the decree and we have basically Sir Robert Anderson saying about 32 AD is the time that Jesus ought to ride in and we have human history telling us basically in the early 30s AD, Jesus of Nazareth came, did these miracles, rode in on a donkey, died, rose again, seen by over 500 people. For us in the church, Daniel 9, 26 is fulfilled. That's done. We know that's the first coming of Christ, to suffer, to be cut off. What we have left is Daniel 9, 26 into 27, and that is we're waiting to see a ruler who rises up, who makes an agreement for one week, seven years, and that agreement allows Israel again to somehow have offering and sacrifice, but halfway through that he's going to turn against them, he's going to begin to persecute them, and it is so bad that God himself has to return to deliver them. Big picture. So what Daniel has seen is the Messiah's coming, and he's going to be cut off. And then there's this other ruler who's going to show up who's going to create all kinds of trouble. That's what he got in chapter 9. And as he's thinking about these things, it opens the door for why we get chapter 10. Okay, because it's determined upon his holy city, Jerusalem, and his people, the Jews. Messiah is going to come, but he's going to be cut off. Then comes this other guy who messes all kinds of things up. And Daniel's sitting there trying to take it in. And as he's before the Lord, he's saying, I want to know more. And that opens the door to chapter 10. So... Do you remember, it seems a while ago now, but do you remember when he saw the four beasts in chapter 7, the lion, and it had the heart given to it like a man's heart, and then he saw again the bear with the three ribs, and one side was bigger than the other, and then he saw the, the leopard with the four sport utility, four wings, four heads, and all that, and then he saw that last fourth beast, and as he saw that fourth beast with the ten horns, a little horn rose up from among those ten horns, and in Gen Daniel chapter 7, it began to speak blasphemous things against the God of gods. Remember that? So he was getting a sense of, okay, there are going to be four major empires. One, he's in Babylon, and that was the head of gold of Daniel 2. Two, there's going to be the Medo-Persians. That's the bear on one side. That's the arms of silver. Three, there's going to be the swift-moving leopard, which is the bronze. That's Alexander the Great, the Greeks which you got in chapter 8, and then for this mystery fourth beast. But out of that fourth beast comes this ruler who begins to persecute God's saints, begins to blaspheme against the God of gods. And interestingly enough, in chapter 7, it says, and his body was given to the burning flame. He's destroyed and chucked into the fire. That's basically his first bit of information about this Antichrist. Then we get in chapter 9, 
And he gets not only more of what this little horn does, but he begins to get how long that little horn gets to run for it, seven years, and how he begins to turn against the Jews and against the world halfway through three and a half years, and then devastation begins to come. These are the things that God has been revealing to him. So chapter 2, chapter 7, and chapter 9 are keep giving to Daniel more and more pieces of a very serious puzzle. And chapter 10 to the end of the book is going to give us basically the outer border. Everybody with me? I got Don in the back. I lost all the rest of you? Okay. So here are some things we learned. We know who cut off the city and the sanctuary after the Messiah. That group of people we know as the Romans. Okay? So the fourth beast is what is or what has been the Roman Empire. And we also know from that fourth beast, eventually we're going to see ten horns or ten kings or ten toes from Daniel 2. And as those ten kings rule together at the same time, out of them will rise up this little leader, this Antichrist. So where does that leave us today? Well, we're looking for what is some form of a reformed Roman Empire with ten major players. And as these ten major players come on the world scene and begin to dominate, suddenly the Antichrist will rise up among them. And we know it's the Antichrist because he's going to make this peace agreement that he will cut off. Okay. So here's some things we need to remember. Daniel 9.27. He, this coming false prince, this little horn who speaks blasphemous things shall confirm the covenant with many for seven years. And in the midst of that week or seven years, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, which means we need another temple. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even till the consummation, and that that is determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Take a look at Daniel 11.36 for a minute, because again, this is something that will take us two weeks to get to. Daniel 11.36, here he begins to pick up again. See, as Daniel's seeking more information, God begins to give more information to him of this coming Antichrist. In verse 36, he says, This king, this prince that's going to come, shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and he shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. We learn more about him. Turn to Zechariah 11, going to the right. Zechariah 11. In Zechariah 11, interestingly enough, the Lord is talking about sending his shepherd who was rejected. Again, Messiah the Prince will be cut off. And so he says in chapter 11, verse 11, Zechariah, it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver, ring any bells? And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized of at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. This is what Judas did. Then I cut asunder my other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto ye yet the instruments of a foolish, or a coarse, or a hardened shepherd. For lo, I raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd, interesting, one who uses images. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaves the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be cleaned up, clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So this false idle shepherd is going to suffer an attack and survive it. Okay, now what? Turn to Matthew 24. Oh, the New Testament, I like that better. Oh, stop, it's all good. Matthew 24. Jesus was asked again the, the sign of his coming, the end of the age, when will the buildings be destroyed? And he begins to give them all kinds of information. But he lets us know that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, verse 14. Then shall the end come. Note this, since we've been in Daniel 9, 
When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, that is, the things set up by this prince who breaks the covenant and makes it desolate. This is an idol. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. This is the one who's going to break that covenant, who's going to set up something that's an abomination. This is that idle shepherd, and he's going to begin to persecute the saints. Then let him which is in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, just run. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, and I'll tell you why. There is no snow removal in Jerusalem. I've seen it. We've actually had groups, we missed it, thankfully, but after, just after us, another group went in, they got six or eight inches of snow. They don't have snow plows, so the group got to stay in a hotel for a day or so until it melted. How do you like that? You finally get to Israel and you're sitting in a hotel watching, you know, Disney movies or something while you're waiting for the snow to melt. Pray that your flight be not in winter. Note this. Neither on the Sabbath day. That's for Jews. For then shall be great tribulation. Last three and a half years. Last middle of the week. Such as was not since the beginning of the world. Uh, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Take a look at also, if you would, 2 Thessalonians 2 to the right. This is all about the little horn from Daniel 7, which we learn is then called this Antichrist, this prince that is to come in Daniel 9. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Paul writing says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. So number one, the second coming. Number two, the sudden removal of his church, which he mentioned to him in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, that the Lord would descend. Voice of the archangel, dead in Christ rise, we are caught up. But we beg you that you be not soon shaken in mind, verse 2, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ, God's judgment, is at hand. Here we go. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, which we are definitely seeing within the church, and that man of sin be revealed. Who is he? The son of perdition. Look at verse 4. This little horn who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, anything, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This hasn't happened yet. And this is that Antichrist. This is that prince who's going to come, who midway will cut off sacrifice and oblation, and that little horn, again, that's to come, will speak blasphemous things against the God of gods. Interesting. Turn, if you would, lastly, to Revelation 13. This is all the same individual that we were seeing in Daniel 9. Revelation 13. You're supposed to teach chapter 10. Getting there. Getting there. In Revelation 13, we learn this. It says... And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, and here we go again, ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, some of the influence of the Grecian world. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, some of the influence of the Medo-Persian world. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion, some of the influence of Babylon and its mysteries. And the dragon, that is Satan from chapter 12, gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Look at this from Zechariah 11. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Again, one of his eyes, one of his arms. And his deadly wound was healed. And because of this, all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, that is the devil, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And again, true to Daniel, as we learned, there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue 40 and two months, which you know is times, time and half a time, or you know as 
three and a half years. Is anybody starting to connect dots here? Like, wait a minute, that's after he, yeah, and this is the same guy, three and a half years. What does he do? Well, he's the little horn of chapter seven. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Last thing, Revelation 19. 1919, it's easy enough to remember. And I saw the beast, this is this antichrist, this little horn who speaks blasphemous things, who cut off offering and sacrifice and began to wear out the saints. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, against the Lord returning, as it says in the beginning of the chapter, and against his army. And the beast was taken with him and the false prophet who, that wrought miracles before him, which had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Great. Now go back to Daniel. And actually go back to Daniel 7. I know, I know, I'm supposed to be in chapter 10, but I'm just laying it out, so. I figure, for, you know, repetition, right? Repetition, repetition, repetition. You get repetition, then hopefully you keep studying for yourself. So here, look at Daniel 7, 8. He said, look, I consider the horns, these 10 horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Look at verse 11. And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld till the beast was slain, his body destroyed, like Revelation 19 says, and given to the burning flame. So, finally, Daniel 9, 27. Know therefore and understand these things are going to come. And this prince... This little horn, this blasphemer against the God of gods, this one who persecutes the saints. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. How long? Front row, got it. How long? Seven years. Great. And in the midst of the week, how long is that? Gold star question for those who paid attention to Matthew 24. What is the official term for the middle of the week until the end called? If you said great tribulation, you got it. And that came from Jesus, Matthew 24, 15. When you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Let the reader understand what we learned from Daniel. Now we've got great tribulation. Like, this is great. No, this means like mega, great, serious trouble, tribulation. In the midst of the week, he shall cut off or cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in the third temple, which will be in Israel, when the land reblooms, the Jews come back from all over the place, their Arab neighbors try to take a whack at them and lose, and suddenly here comes a peace agreement that allows them to build this thing. Let me know if you see any of those hints. He will cut off offering and sacrifice to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, setting up these idols he demands to have worshipped, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, again, that is the coming together of many parts coming to an end even to the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And that's where it ends. And Daniel sits there and goes, hoy, what was all that? And you're thinking, I feel the same way, and it's two weeks that you tried to show me what it means. So he begins to seek God again. And it takes two years to hear from him. How many of you will stay on the job for two years seeking God for something? Two years. So chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, we're now in 536 B.C., for those keeping score, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true. 
But the time appointed was long. In fact, so long as we go from chapter 10 all the way to chapter 12 that we're going to go through not only the the breakup of the Greco-Roman world of of Alexander the Great, but then we're going to watch basically the rise of the Antichrist even to the end of the age and even to the final resurrection gets mentioned in Revelation 12. He basically sees all the way down the line and then has to explain it to us. The thing was appointed for a long time and he understood the thing and had understanding of, once again, a vision. So verse 2, in those days, that is the third year of Cyrus, as the Jews are heading back, they're beginning to get some momentum, trying to lay the foundation of the second temple, and Ezra and Nehemiah, or at least Ezra, has gone back, and they're working on this, and they're bringing back the vessels, and there's, again, about 49,000 returning, and then the prophets had to encourage them, Haggai and Zechariah and all that, but that's, that's another day. In this time, I had understanding of the vision, So in those days, I, Daniel, verse 2, was mourning a three full weeks fasting, praying. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. How many remember, it seems like forever ago, but chapter 1, where he was eating only what? Vegetables. How many remember that? And why was he only eating vegetables? Because he was getting a portion of meat from the king's table, And the Babylonians would not have kosher prepared where the blood is drained properly. And they would drink wine that's not diluted where the Jews would add anywhere from three to six parts. So he didn't want to drink strong drink. And he didn't want to eat flesh that had not been properly prepared from a a, um, kosher point of view. However, Daniel has risen up and has become a great man. He's one of the three presidents. And he actually, Darius, thought about making him the chief president. So now Daniel has reached a place of authority where he can get his own menu, get the food prepared the way he wants it. So interestingly enough, later in his career when he's established, he does eat meat and he does drink wine. But these would be according to what would be kosher specifications and therefore not something to defile him. Everybody got that? Because you think, well, this is an inconsistency. No, it means the guy's arrived and he has his own chef. That's basically what we're learning. But during these three weeks, I ate no pleasant bread. We will learn in just a minute in verse 4. It's around the time of Passover. What do you get rid of the week before or during the week of Passover? What do you get rid of? Leaven. He's eating unleavened bread. And the time period is Passover, which was God's deliverance from the last time they were in bondage to somebody. And so, three full weeks, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till the three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, so about ten days after Passover, if you're following along, so about ten days before Passover, he had been fasting, seeking the Lord and reducing his his diet, so to speak. But in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, known to you in the Greek translation as Tigris. Tigris coming from the Septuagint. Now, how many remember the Garden of Eden? Not personally, but at least the description in the book of Genesis. What was one of the rivers mentioned? The Hittichel or the Tigris. Oh, P- Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris. Wait, so that means that, means that Babylon's where the Garden of Eden was? Wait a second. What it means is when they got off the ark near this area of the mountains of Ararat, which is not far away from Tigris and Euphrates, when they found these rivers, they said, you know, that reminds me of things we used to know. Let's call it the Hittichel or the Tigris. Well, could it be where the Garden of Eden was? The answer is, it could be. Could it also not be where the Garden of Eden was? The answer is, it could not be. There are traditions among the Jews that Jerusalem was a Garden of Eden. I've heard some very interesting ideas around that, but no point in going at it now. How many have heard of Paris, Texas? How many have heard of Paris, France? How many have heard of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? How many have heard of Philadelphia and Jordan? There's the city of Philadelphia and Jordan. How many have heard of Philadelphia in former Asia Minor known to you as Turkey? Does mankind have a habit of reusing names? Yes, they do. So whether or not it's the actual spot or not, they decided to name it the Hittichel or the Tigris. And so there, in the four and twentieth day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, which is the Tigris, or Hittichel. Verse 5. So then I lifted up my eyes, as he's been fasting and waiting on the Lord, and looked. And behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel kind of a topaz, a brilliant yellow, kind of yellow-brown. And his face was the appearance 
of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and feet like in color to polished brass and the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. Turn to Revelation 1. I think we can figure out who he is seeing. Revelation chapter 1, John writing said in verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, that said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. What you write, what you see, write and send. I turned to see the voice, verse 12, that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. What are those? If you came with us on Sunday morning, you know. If not, keep reading. In the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, note this, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the chest with a golden girdle or sash. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as the flame of fire, and his feet like unto Chakolai Ben and fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So, Oh, by the way, we should keep going. He had seven stars in his right hand, out of his mouth on a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. Dear church, Daniel chapter 10, who is he seeing? He is seeing Messiah the Prince. And there are two characters he wanted to know about. One, Messiah the Prince. Two, who's this false prince? And he's going to get information on both. Interesting, back now to Daniel 10, one more attribute of this Messiah the Prince. Look at chapter 12 of Daniel. Again, this is all connected, so we've got to just poke around. Daniel, as he's taking this whole thing, and at the end of the vision is told to seal up the words of the book, even to the time of the end, which I think we're in. But many shall run to and fro. We talked about in the beginning of this book long ago. Knowledge will be increased. Verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, back here at the Tigris, there stood other two, the one on one side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river, which means these two are standing each on the opposite sides of the river. Well, this is obvious. Keep reading. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who we just met in chapter 10, verse 5, which was upon the waters. Who has eyes of flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze, a uh, face like the shining of the sun or lightning in its strength, who walks on water? Who is that? How many just went, oh my goodness? Yeah. And then you got to write it in a book and explain it. So back to our chapter. So I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz, his body was also like the barrel. His face is the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and feet like in color to polished brass. His voice, or the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking, trembling, or fear fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. This guy's all by himself. Therefore... Was I left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained, same word as left, and there left or remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. I saw him, and I was wiped out. Interestingly enough, if you look at Revelation 1, John, as we think, late 80s, early 90s, he sees the Lord in similar appearance, and Boom, right down he goes to his face. He said, I felt like a dead man. Daniel, we think in his 80s, these two poor old guys, man, they have this interaction with Jesus, and boom, they're down on their faces. You know, these old, oh, down they go. I was left alone. My comeliness was turning me into corruption because he's seeing the Lord. I retained no strength, yet... I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, this is an angel ministering to him. We'll see it as we get in 12, chapter 12. He said, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, 
Daniel, for thou, from, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand. Understand what? Who is this little horn? When is the Messiah going to come in? How will we know it's him? All these things he's been seeing, he's trying to figure out. Since the day you began to ask for this understanding, the day you began to set your heart to understand, verse 12, and to chasten thyself before God, your words were heard, and I am come for thy words. God was already answering from the moment he started praying. What an encouragement. Whatever is on your heart this evening, God is already working on it. How many of you have learned that a no with God is as much a yes? No, no, one in the back. All right. Things you're like, Lord, I got to have this, got to have this. And he says, no. A no with God means, no, this isn't for you. I have something else. The problem is we often get so fixated on the no, we think he doesn't love us and where is he and all that. And meanwhile, he's like, I got something better. Would you just settle down? Just wait. And then when he brings you, we're like, oh, Lord, you're so smart. Oh, so great. I would have never thought of that. I mean... Your words were heard, and I'm come for your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. This is an angel speaking. So something of the demonic realm, an authority, a fallen angel, is basically withstanding him. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. He's been praying three weeks. He's been waiting on the Lord. Below, Michael, who's he? That second angel mentioned in Daniel. One of the chief princes. How many remember the book of Jude when we talked about him? There in the book of Jude, verse 9, he's called Michael the Archangelos, that is the chief or head angel. Michael the Archangel. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there, and it seems to indicate the idea of I remained there in a position of dominance after his help. I remain there with the kings of Persia. What we have just been given is basically the veil has been pulled off of government. So here we know, as we've worked through so far, chapters 1 through 9, first is going to come the Babylonians, then is going to come the Medo-Persians, great. After them is going to come from chapter 8, the Greeks, and then after them is going to come this fourth beast, which now, thanks to the benefit of history, we know shows up right after the Messiah, or shows up at the time of the Messiah, and after he's cut off, they destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's Rome. Now we can put it together. But as he's seeing this, and he's getting this information, right, he's learning that as the earthly realm of government is moving and power is rising and countries are waning, what's really happening behind the scenes is also the angelic realm is in opposition to the demonic realm that seeks to stay entrenched or run power and then God will depose and then what falls is the earthly government after the demonic realm is, is restrained or broken or removed in some fashion. So the prince of Persia is now the dominant one on the scene, but he's going to be pulled back, this demonic entity, and eventually Grisha is going to be allowed to come in. And this is all happening first in the angelic realm versus the demonic realm. Can you imagine what must be happening right now in Washington, D.C.? Jerusalem? Russia? Putin's decided to sort of redefine the, the Constitution on some issues. Then you got Turkey. What could go wrong? Or Dewan is trying to basically take a foothold in Libya and take it over. He's now in some ways you know, kind of juxtaposed against the Russians. There's a lot of really messed up stuff happening around the world geopolitically if you're paying attention. Then you got China where Xi Jinping decided he should just be able to rule for life. Putin liked that idea. He's working on it. And this is all the earthly realm that is being first influenced by the angelic and the demonic realm. You see, we're told we don't wrestle, wrestle against flesh and blood, but against strongholds, principalities, powers. We're told that Satan's the god of this age. If you go back through your New Testament, look up principalities and powers, you're going to find many references, Ephesians, Colossians, so many other places, mentioning principalities and powers. There is, you see, God has set the holy angels. There's Michael the archangel, there's Gabriel's and others, and then we've got this, this hierarchy of angels. Satan is constantly the counterfeiter, so he comes in with his own hierarchy of fallen angels, and so you've got this kingdom of darkness going against the kingdom of light. Spoiler alert, there's no competition. No competition. When the time finally comes for the consummation to happen, done. Done. It's easy. 
But right now these things are playing out. Why? Because God tells us the end from the beginning so that we might know it's him. Things we should look for is Israel back in the land, land reblooming, Jews coming from all over the place, Russia getting strength with these other nations trying to take out Israel. While they're talking about, say, building a third temple, while somebody proposes, say, why don't we do a peace agreement and can't we all get along sing Kumbaya? What are we seeing in the news? All that. And we were told it's going to come. And we have famines, pestilences, wars, falling away in the church, and a generation that is so steeped in technology that they're so busy here, they aren't looking up here anymore. And worse, they're not looking up there either. So, behind the human realm is the angelic and the demonic realm. The prince of Persia, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. If you'd like an example of this, read at home Ezekiel 28. First, Ezekiel is led to speak to the prince of Tyre, the earthly ruler, and then he is moved by the spirit to speak to the king of Tyre, Satan himself. Look at the description who is influencing the prince of Tyre. You can see a very simple example of how that works in Ezekiel 28. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. But now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people, which means we're on Jewish ground, which means that fourth beast is going to be interacting with the Jews, which means it's the Romans because they show up and they cut off the offering the sanctuary in the city. And during their rule, the Messiah is cut off. So we now again know that fourth beast. It's the Romans because it's again your people. And what shall befall them in the last days? Yet the vision is for many days. Again, Ephesians 121, principalities and powers. You can see, for example, John again, talking about Satan being the prince of this world, John 12. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan is the god of this world. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Romans 8, 38, again, principalities. Ephesians 3, 10, principalities. You'll see these all throughout if you want to take the time to study it. This is just pulling the veil and giving us a snapshot. Now I am come, verse 14, to make you understand what will befall your people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb, just put to silence, again, overwhelmed by these things. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips and I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision, my sorrows, again, the, the writhing or twisting of pain, the idea, anguish and sorrows, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. I am wiped out. For how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me, one, like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And he said, O oh man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I am come unto, come unto thee? Do you know why I have come? Do you understand? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, again, to hold off and work behind the scenes of government. When I am gone forth, when he removes from this, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So again, the angelic demonic world first, the human realm second. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, which you hold in your hand. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince, Michael, this archangel, who we'll see again in chapter 12. And so also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, 539, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. So here we have a human ruler at the will of Cyrus, Darius, standing up, beginning to reign. And not only is Darius in the human realm reigning, but in the angelic realm behind him, he is being sustained. I wonder if this is what the Lord was trying to tell us when he says, pray for those who are in authority, for kings and governors, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We think earthly rulers. Yet behind it is the demonic realm and the angelic realm. We are headed towards a strong delusion. 
where people will believe the lie, 2 Thessalonians 2. And it says they'll believe the lie because they would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, they would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They've rejected Jesus Christ. God is going to send to them a strong delusion. We are on the cusp of seeing many things that have been wondered at. Daniel, blown away as he sees them, you are actually in the generation where they're back in the land, the land is reproducing, the Jews are from all over, they're talking constantly about a third temple, the church is getting lukewarm, we're watching some things heat up again in the Middle East, and you're wondering, I wonder if I should, you know, be serious about God. You are seeing things the church wondered about. Commentaries from the 1800s. Somehow Israel's going to be back in the land. Uh, how's that going to happen? I don't know, but he says that they're going to be back in the land. You've pretty much grown up and lived with it. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. And we were told to the day, basically, when he would enter Jerusalem and be cut off. And that's history. Then we're told there's going to be suddenly a final seven years, and it's going to start with somebody finally getting a peace agreement that allows Israel to build a third temple. We're on the cusp of that. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, you have 300-plus prophecies that he fulfilled. Death, resurrection, burial, miracles, and on and on and on. Betrayal, rejection by his own. And he loves you. If you struggle with, well, but that means I got to, you know, quit fooling around with my girlfriend or stop doing this or doing that or the people at work will make fun of me. And so I, I don't know about that. Ah, gee, I don't know. If you're having trouble now, how are you going to do when the strong delusion comes because you would not receive the love of the truth? I mean, you hear this evening or you're watching or listening later on the radio or your radio is broken in your car to one station which there's actually a story of someone I knew whose radio broke to a Christian radio station. It was an old Jaguar, and he got saved because he couldn't tune anything else in. <laughs> but the fact is the day's at hand. We could wake up tomorrow and suddenly things are flying through the heavens in the Middle East. The oil market is suddenly devastated. We might be the only shrimp boat out in the harbor, so to speak, at that point, because we produce now, we're exporting, which may be the one thing that can pull this country out of its economic troubles. Suddenly, the Middle East gets disrupted as the supply chain, Strait of Hormuz goes down, Saudi Arabia gets hit with a bunch of cruise missiles, their refineries go down, Russians have some other issues perhaps go on, and suddenly we're one of the few games in town for natural gas and for oil, and everything could change. And everything could change in one night. Do you know him? Have you asked him to forgive you? He's willing to. He is the Savior. And now is the acceptable year of the Lord. But back to Daniel. I also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Behind a physical ruler was one in the spiritual realm strengthening him. And now I will show you the truth. We're out of time. We'll pick it up here next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Daniel. Every time he got a taste of what's coming, he hungered for more. And he would not stop asking you and waiting and praying and fasting. And you gave to him, as we get into chapter 11, some of the most complex, succinct, and fulfilled prophecies the world's seen. Because you wanted to make sure that we could know your word is truth. You know the end from the beginning. You call things before they happen. So that we can trust that you are God, there is no other. That we can look unto you and be saved. Because you know, again, the things to come before they happen. Thank you for these things, Lord, that you've revealed to us. Thank you for Daniel's heart to pursue them. And Lord, how I pray that we would live in an expectation. We are in interesting times. How long, I don't know. But we are watching a number of things converge that have not happened before. 
Help us, Lord, to live with expect expectancy. Help us, Lord, to be excited no matter what you have going on in our lives. We could wake up and suddenly it's a whole new world tomorrow. And you're looking for us to be salt and light, just to be witnesses. We may not be evangelists, but we can be witnesses. So help us to live in a way that people can see that we have been with Jesus. Bless your people as they go, Lord, and thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.